One of the great pleasures of being at a conference like this is meeting really smart, big thinkers. And uh, you're getting ready to hear from one of those really smart, big thinkers, uh, Dame Wendy Hall. Uh, but before I introduce her, uh, how many of you have heard of web science? Not web of science, but web science. So it's sort of like what nanoscience was 20 years ago, right? Oh. An emergent discipline uh, that is looking at a small phenomenon, you know, the, the World Wide Web, and its emergent properties and the way it's transforming society. And so uh, our speaker, uh, Dame Hall, uh, Dame Wendy, <laughs> is uh, perfectly situated to be able to talk to you about this because her career has tracked the emergence of the web. She's had many different positions, both faculty and honorary fellowships, et cetera, that have given her insights into the power of the web. And she is currently uh, with Southampton University and the director of the Web Science Institute and is favoring us with her presence in Washington, D.C. as a Klug Fellow at the Library of Congress, where I assume you're going to be continuing to do your research on this. And she is quite eager to share her results, but also quite eager to meet people who share her research interests. So after you hear her talk, come up and talk to her about how you can work with her to further the web science. Thank you very much. I'm saying thank you. That was a lovely introduction. If I stay here, yeah, it's good. Um, right, first of all, thank you, Bill. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Uh, we never met before, but we already know we have a lot in common. And thank you, Katia, for introducing us. I would like to say, uh, I'm sure there'll be some thank yous at the end, but I would like everyone to thank Katia for today uh, already. Katia, thank you so much. And Saskia, yes. Um, such bundles of energy. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here. And I have the luxury of an hour. I'll try, I won't talk for an hour. I, I could, I could talk forever, but I will, I'll try and talk for 40, 45 minutes so that we can have some questions. It's a great luxury to have a bit longer. And I'm very humbled to be doing this in the presence of so many scientists, so many brilliant scientists who've, who've had to squeeze into a much uh, smaller time slot to talk about what they're doing. But this is big picture stuff. I'm not really going to talk about our results. Um, I'm going to try and give you some of the big picture. So yes, I am at the Library of Congress, and uh, that may come up a bit in my talk. It's really that I'm there, really, because they have some amazing web archives, and they need to understand what they should be archiving about what happens on the web, how they should be archiving it, and how they should be making those uh, that data available to researchers in the future. And it is no mean challenge. It's really hard and it's a challenge that libraries and data repositories all over the world are facing and we're just at the tip of that iceberg now. Uh, and it's very important because of course we are losing. Uh, the web, this is, uh, I could talk for the whole day on this slide. This is the uh, history of the web and as Bill said, largely the history of my research on the web. I started doing, um, hypertext before Tim produced the web, and I met him at a conference before the web, talking about hypertext. But largely, my career has, my research career, has tracked uh, the, the, um, the development of the web in both senses of that, that phrase. Um, and uh, in that time, we have already lost more uh, huge amounts of information uh, that will never be found again. I'll come back to that during the talk. I'm not going to go into this because there isn't time. And I've got some new stuff in this talk, challenged by Katia to produce some modeling. I have. And um, uh, uh, just to make the point that uh, this web, you know, it started as one website that Tim put up December 1990. And now it's billions, trillions of them um, and uh, layered on top of the internet uh, uh, has completely transformed our lives in so many different ways. And yet it's, com it's totally fragile. It's robust in some ways, but it's incredibly fragile in others. 
uh, because nobody owns it, nobody governs it, we don't know how it works, we don't know all, you know, there's so many big questions that we don't understand, and yet it's determining everything we do. And if it disappeared tomorrow, how would we cope? And yet, we, so in 25 years, we have destroyed many of the, not uh, destroyed is a very big word. There's many of the industries, take publishing, for example, or um, uh, uh, the, the high street shops um, <laughs> that, that, that we have depended on for hundreds of years have gone or are going because of this, the internet and everything that sits on top of it. And this has happened in 25 years. So we now rely on Wikipedia to get our information, and it's only existed 10 years. And it's, you know, it's, if, if this all disappeared, you know, Wikipedia is run by a, a, a small team of people with donations like you have for PBS, right? It's, it's completely non-sustainable in some ways. What sustains it, right? And we should be worried about that because this is an information infrastructure that we have created uh, and that it's up to us collectively, and by us I mean us as scientists, I mean policymakers, I mean, uh, I mean the, the community at large, um, to ensure that this thing keeps going and is for the good. Because if it starts only being used for the bad, the crime and the porn and the bullying and the it will all go deep underworld, and we will have lost it. So, and uh, yeah, anyway, I was talking to someone yesterday about encryption, all the problems that that we need it, but uh, it was actually with Sandy Pentland. Uh, we so need it, but if everything is encrypted, how do we how do we work, and how do we stop the bad things happening? So there are major, major, major challenges, and one of my uh, most enjoyable things in the last year has been on a new a commission for internet governance, just trying to come up with some principles, some guiding factors as to how policymakers should think about this in the future. Because what so many of you have said is that most of our politicians, the people running our world, have no understanding of this technology at all. And uh, we were having there was a discussion at lunchtime after the policy session this morning about how you have to give it to them in sound bites and narratives. Uh, you know, the data doesn't help because and it, sometimes it's very short-term thinking, but this has to be for the long term. And we don't know what that means. It's only existed for 20 years, really. So anyway, um, another point I will just make before I move on. As things emerge, for example, Google didn't emerge until nearly 10 years after the first website went up. Um, the, the, uh, the, um, we didn't get broadband and Wi-Fi until the turn of the century. So some, again, uh, over 10 years, uh, about 10 years after the first website went up. So many of the things we take for granted today could only, like the social networks, um, could only exist because we, people weren't going to uh, uh, use Facebook and Twitter if they had to be sitting at home on their computer in the numbers that they do. What's driven the, t the revolution has been the change of technology on top of uh, the, uh, the inventions of Surf and Khan and Berners-Lee and so on in the internet. And, and often people had that, like the people thought about online shopping in the early days of the internet, but the technology just wasn't there to deliver it. To deliver it. So I remember reading after the dot-com bust in, um, uh, I can't see the dates here, uh, the turn of the century, um, in a very well-known newspaper, that that was the end of internet shopping, and we've proved categorically that no one ever wants to shop on the internet. Well, it was, <laughs> it was only because the technology wasn't there. To, we didn't have computers at home, they weren't cheap enough, we didn't have one. It wasn't that we'd proved that people didn't want to shop on the internet. And, the, and that's leading me on to say, this is all about people. It's not really about the technology. The technology, in some cases, uh, take the, the web protocols, actually it's an incredibly simple technology. The idea was great. The technology is really simple. But uh, it's what we do with it that's creative and complex because you can't predict what people are going to, hu individual human behavior. And that's really the whole point of web science is this is a socio-technical system and you have to study it from lots of different um, uh, angles, lots of different disciplines. So 
Uh, I won't say any more about that. Let's move on. So I became uh, why we launched Web Science, and I'm just showing this to show you my one little bit of um, uh, resonating with something Bill said earlier. I had already put it in the talk, but it's amazingly synergistic. Um, I was very involved with. Uh, with Nigel, Nigel Shadbolt and Tim Berners-Lee and Jim Hendler and others in the development of the semantic web. And we wrote this paper in 2006 to try and demystify, demystify for technologists anyway, because that's all uh, gobbledygook there, it's all acronyms, uh, the semantic web, because it had gone off into what I called an AI, artificial intelligence rat hole, uh, where everyone was trying to work out whether you could have global ontologies and, and how to join ontologies, and this was, um, Ben or like this is the theory before the practice and the web is all about the ABC of research because you have to build in this system you have to build you have to put uh, to build the web we had to put the documents out there and then we develop the theories and to build the semantic web we had to get the data out there and then we could develop the theory doing it the other way around was the wrong way to do it the AI community were trying to theorize about the semantic web and they would have, could have carried on doing that for decades, and we wouldn't have built it. We'd have had some fine papers, and people would have got their fellowships of the Royal Society and whatever, but it wouldn't have actually built anything. So what we had to do around uh, the middle of the, uh, in the 2004, 2005, was say to people, put your data out there, put it into a format which you can link, and link it and see what happens. And it was only because there were some very big, uh, you know, we, we, Tim and others and myself included, managed to get people to put semantic data out there. We started linking it. And 10 years later, we have semantic data everywhere. And lots of companies are using it. And it's beginning to become a cornerstone for many of the software developments today. But in uh, 2004, five, it's absolutely the realm of the theoretical computer scientists and logicians and philosophers. Um, and uh, so that's a, an interesting story in itself. But, so we were trying to demystify it for people who could read uh, acronym soup. And uh, while we were doing that, we were thinking about this whole, we went back to this, oops, sorry, wrong way, we went back to this picture and, and started thinking about, actually, this is a socio-technical system. But before I tell you about that, I just want, this is something I don't usually talk about, but this was um, actually Saskia and uh, Katia really got me thinking about this. And so this is something we did in 2004. I say we, um, notice my name isn't on that, but <laughs> so it's actually the guys in the group uh, who, who did the report. Um, we, Nigel and I had a project called Advanced Knowledge Technologies, um, and it was 2001 to 2006, seven. It was a big project lots of universities in the UK. I won't tell you about that, but as part of that, we were looking, there wasn't any semantic data. So it was really hard to do experiments on semantic data because there wasn't any out there. So we had to create it. So in order to do anything, we had to harvest data and then make it semantic. And what we did for the EPSRC, which is the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK, they wanted to know uh, what the impact of their funding for the, their life sciences initiative had been. So this was a new interdisciplinary initiative, like, you know, you know, you know all about those. And they they'd put a huge amount of funding, I don't remember, but many, many millions, tens of millions of funding, maybe hundreds of millions of funding. And they wanted to see what impact that had had. And so, uh, uh, led really by Hugh, who uh, discovered these slides for me. Um, they, they went about this project, they were given 10K, I think, and they took a lot of resources from the research councils. They took basically the names of the people, the, the scientists who'd been funded, the projects, and they got their, we were doing open access ePrints at the time, they got their publications and they, um, from three research councils, and they, took, they, they harvested the data from all that information, so authors, papers, projects, institutions, and, and they put, made it into semantic data, and then started to see, try and look and see how the, um, how the networks had grown, and what new networks had grown, and where the people who had been given the funding had ended up publishing, and who with. So you haven't got time to read it all. Basically, that was the conceptual diagram. Lots of data, they uh, developed an ontology, 
put it in a knowledge repository, and developed applications like this one. And uh, you won't be able to see it because um, this is a very old version I should have here, but um, this is a visualization that uh, they developed based on the semantic data, and it shows um, how, if you, if, you can, if you can see up here, you can just see names of papers and people, and you see how people move between the different networks uh, as the, uh, the project unfolds and they start working with other disciplines and they show there how the semantic data uh, is being used. So you can't read that, but that was an example and, um, of what we were doing with semantic data, creating it. We, had, we developed a triple store um, for, the, for the data. Now I go back to PowerPoint. And... Um, this was the recommendations, right? EPSRC, if you take this approach, you could lead the world in terms of impact of the science that you're funding. And what did they do? Bill, what do you think the answer is? Nothing. Right, they, <laughs> they'd funded the project. We'd shown them how to do it in 2004, but they had no idea what we were talking about. Absolutely no idea. Nobody understood about data. Very few people understood about those sorts of valuizations. There was no concept of impact of science, science of science. They said, thank you very much. That's very interesting. And that project uh, was part. And I had to, when I was in Indiana, uh, and I was talking to them about the work we'd done, I thought, I wonder where the data is. And in fact, it was all um, on Hugh's hard disk drive. And he sent me that report that I sent to you. He sent me that AVI file and these PowerPoint slides. And he's got all the data. But if something had happened to Hugh and I hadn't got his contact, I wouldn't have known where that is. It was lost. That piece of work, the data that led to that had, had been lost. I'll come back to that later in the talk. But now, of course, 10, 12 years later, uh, people understand a bit more about the power of data. People understand a bit more about linked data, open data, and big data. And uh, so this terminology you can start to use because people know they need to understand. This is the way we are going to do science. And in fact, uh, going forward, many, many, uh, lots of science will be done based on data going forward. Because we have the computer technology and the web and the internet have enabled us to generate huge amounts of data, the computers enabled us to process that. and. Um, and now we're getting the funding to use it. Uh, I was going to say something else, but my that's gone. So, oh yes, the other thing about linked data, I should say that linked data was always part of Tim's original vision, right? It was always, um, uh, he, he said it was not just a web of documents, linked documents, this is going to be a web of linked data. And if we do that, because machines can interpret the data in ways they can't interpret documents, we will be able to infer knowledge that we couldn't have inferred any other way. So his vision was that we would be able to get new knowledge using this technology, actually get new knowledge. And we're seeing some of that. But of course, there's a huge downside to this as well, with uh, the ethics and the privacy and the security and trust and all those issues that have emerged. So um, just jumping back to uh, when we were doing the semantic web work, that's when we decided to think this whole idea that this was a socio-technical system, that we should, it was so important to the world that it needed to be studied in its own right. Um, so uh, that, was the, that was the big point we made, that this is a, this is, we created a macro, uh, a complex macro phenomenon, we being people and the technology, and, uh, uh, and that needs to be studied. We called it web science. And I always used to say, there's two things I hate about that term. One is web and the other is science. And of course, lots of things come up afterwards. You know, why don't you call it network science? Why don't you call it complex, complexity theory, complex theory? Why don't you call it computational social science? Why don't you? Well, actually, it's because we're studying this particular phenomena, uh, like people study the weather. I'll come back to that again later. So it does need its own name. But it is overlaps with all those other things that I mentioned. Um, so we jumped off a cliff without any wings in November 2006, that's 10 years ago now, and we launched the Web Science Research Initiative, that's uh, Southampton and MIT, it started, and then we developed the Web Science Trust. This is just the, the narrative around my talk. Um, this is the butterfly diagram that Nigel drew 
to explain that actually this is a lot of there's a lot of different disciplines. Well, I talk about socio-technical, but there's of course politics, economics, uh, psychology, engineering, media. There should be education on there and philosophy on there. Lots of different disciplines that you can put as a lens to study this phenomenon. Um, but it is an interdisciplinary subject. It's not just about technology and not just about sociology. It is people coming together from those different disciplines to look at this phenomenon. Um, we have a, a network of labs. Uh, there are several representatives here, Indiana, Northwestern, and so on, are um, examples of labs where people are working on problems that are very um, associated with the web science principles. Uh, so that's the background. Why has that stopped? Oh, right. I just want to say one other thing, which is as we've gone along the way, um, we've, come, we've come to use another term that we, uh, Tim used first, that is um, thinking of the web and things that are built on using the web as a social machine. Um, and this has become a meme that is now also um, growing quite fast. Um, so this is recasting web science as the theory and practice of social machines. And Tim, uh, this is one of the most parsed sent paragraphs in, uh, in any book I know, because uh, anyone who talks about this uses this paragraph to explain it. But in his book, Weaving the Web, Tim wrote this, this rather incoherent, but uh, <laughs> it's the <laughs> paragraph, but it's the one in which he, dis he, he, his vision was quite clear from the beginning. He sort of knew this was gonna, go ha gonna happen, just couldn't quite talk about how. But, well, he knew he'd, done, he'd created the technology, but it was, what were people going to do with this invention? He didn't know. Um, but it's the idea that, um, that as, as, uh, in real life, we, we obey all sorts of constraints. I mean, we sit around this room, uh, we, you know, we, we, sit, we space ourselves out, we queued nicely for food, um, you know, we, 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 um, we live by certain principles that we've grown up with about how to conduct our lives. And we have governments that help governments that help us do that. But basically, we, we as a society, we have con con created constraints by what means we can live together and be more effective working together than if we were all bashing each other over the head to get our food. Uh, so um, what Tim said here was computers can help us do this in the digital world, can help if we can use them to create abstract social machines on the web processes in which people do the creativity and the machine does the administration and the stage is set for an evolutionary growth of new social engines. He's really talking about how we live as a, as a society in the digital world. And he's saying that we will live through the machines. We will do things and the machines will implement. We will want to do things and the machines will implement them for us. And so if you think about that in terms of all the things that have grown up that we now know so well on and around the web, the web itself, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Wikipedia, the, 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 the smaller things like TripAdvisor and crowdsourcing like Zooniverse and uh, the Ushahidi project and Amazon, eBay, YouTube, they've all morphed and they've all been, you know, some of the companies have bought Built, uh, bought other ver smaller versions of these. Think of Flickr as well and YouTube and, and the places where actually it's quite a f an amazing phenomenon that um, we have collectively, we as people, so it's like the network of people and the network of machines don't know anything about each other, but together collectively we create artifacts that wouldn't have existed before. You know, a classic example being Wikipedia, but all the others that are listed there are examples of things where they started with very simple technology. We did things with them, and as we, society, collectively did things with them, they evolved into something else. And you've got, you know, you've got the business economics case on top of that, but the amazing thing is, because of the way Tim designed the um, protocols for the web, and because he made them open and free <coughs> to use, we get, give rise to these effective monopolies, right? You have effectively one, uh, one um, social network, you have one microblogging blogging site, you have one place you put your videos and look what YouTube has become. You have one place where you put your photos until Yahoo destroyed it a bit. And you had, uh, you know, you have one shop and one auction place. And if you go to a different culture and a different, uh, 
language like China, you have the same things, they're different companies, but you have the same sort of artifacts and you tend to have one of them. And they, they, they morph like plasticine and they grow and they change and we don't know how they will in the future, but, but, but it's all, you know, you know where to go uh, um, for your blogging or your microblogging or your social network. And who knows, I mean, what will happen to Twitter and will Facebook take over the world? And they're quite, because Google, for example, um, Google relies on an open web to work, totally relies on an open web. Google depends on us making links and looking at information in order to, for its algorithm to work. Whereas Facebook is completely the opposite. Facebook would like a closed system that they control. And they're trying increasingly to bring all the information into Facebook. My thesis would be that would destroy what we, it would make it something completely different. Uh, but I can't prove that to you. That's just my instinct as to how it will evolve. And I don't know how any of these will evolve. Um, uh, and, and of course, they become companies, and then they need to develop business models. So you there have the economics and that. So, and uh, they're all different types of models. You know, um, Tim could have uh, commercialized the web, and uh, uh, Wikipedia man. My brain's gone. What's his name? Come on, Jim. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Jimmy Wales. He could have sold Wikipedia to any of the big. You know, it's like Media Britannica, and it would have been very different. But they didn't. So, so you know, they're, 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 they're different types of social machines. But anyway, it's this idea. Going back to the definition, just by the way, Tim says computers help if we can use them to create abstract social machines uh, in which the people do the creativity and the machines do the administration. The problem comes when the computers do the creativity as well. That might happen in the future. So we have to think about that. Anyway, moving on. Social machines are. Uh, where big data meets uh, social networking. And uh, we have a, Nigel and I and uh, others, uh, Southampton, Oxford, and Edinburgh have a big grant. We're studying these social machines. But how do you study them? Now, this is where I want to bring my modeling in. Um, and this, I've never actually talked about this before. This is work done by our mathematicians, which I think is just amazing. I used to be a mathematician. I was an algebraic topologist. My PhD is in algebraic topology. So I do have a yearning towards this work. But this is um, some work our mathematicians have done on the shape of Zooniverse, because we're trying to study, classify the different the types of social machines in order to understand them and think about how they evolve. Uh, and it's really hard because, as I said, you can't predict what human beings are going to do, how they're going to behave in this space. There's a potential quantum element here. I, um, I, I can't pronounce that. ASAD is the visualization software they're using. Um, so basically, if you don't know Zooniverse, this is uh, the citizen science project that works ar uh, around the world, but it's based uh, mostly out of Oxford, I think. Although there's a big lab here in the States that may have done the software, I can't remember. But it's basically about allowing, enabling people, help, or getting people to help classify galaxies, right, without them having a PhD in physics. Uh, and that's what it's all about. And uh, actually, it started out as... Uh, people doing something that the machines couldn't do yet, because they, the machines weren't clever enough to spot these, pick up these galaxies. So I argued it wasn't a social machine at first, but it has become one as they create their networks around this whole, uh, uh, how do you classify a, a galaxy? And uh, so they, they, these amazing collaboration networks where you get new people coming in and uh, people with some physics background helping the newbies to understand how to classify a galaxy. And it's these networks, I'm going to have to whiz through this, that Jacek and his team have been analyzing. And they can, you know, they've done comparisons with random graphs, and Galaxy Zoo definitely has different characteristics to a random graph. So what they did was apply topological analysis to this. And they used, um, they did some work, and they decided that was the shape. So this is the modeling bit, because they may or may not be right about that. But they, this is the modeling bit. They, they did some initial work and decided that was the shape. And then they used some work by this, these people who published a paper in 2007 to disaggregate that shape and, and split it into four sections. And then they color-coded the networks, the analysis they were doing in the networks, according to those sections, where, they, where things were in the, in the network. They then did all the data collection, some of it by hand initially, as good mathematicians, and then they automated it. 
So uh, they started to pick up who, what type of uh, interactions people were having. having. Right, so you can see there, user one, what's this thing? Someone answers, it's a something. And user two has uh, also found out user three likes cats. Right, which is nothing to do with galaxies at all. So they built their networks. And then they, using the uh, visualization software, they decided that the shape of the universe is a tadpole. But um, that may or may not be right, and it may or may not be interesting. But what, uh, so they color coded according to different fac uh, facets. And then another, the really cool bit is they applied some natural language processing. So they applied natural language processing to analyze the comments in the universe came up with four topics. Again, this is the modeling bit. And then they started color coding according to those topics. Uh, that's color by physics, and they started doing the characteristics of the networks. Color by help uh, codes, and, and as uh, uh, Connor says, it's you're a helper or a helpee, but you use the same words, so they can't. Anyway, um, they uh, have some initial results which they're publishing now. And to me, I. I'm, I'm not, don't ask me any hard questions about the, the topological analysis behind this, but the um, conclusion is this is a, a, a way to classify a social machine, and it's just a first experiment. They've done, they did some on old work that, that showed that what they were doing worked on some old work to do with diabetes, and now this is the first experiment. And I think this is potentially the Big Bang Theory for social machines. Right, this is, this, if we can actually get the data, do this type of analysis over and over again on the different social machines, we can then, using the topological data analysis, start to, to classify social machines properly, rather than just guessing. And then you'll be able to see when a social machine is morphing from one type of social machine into another. And I think this, this is all about the birth of a social machine, deciding is it going to be one that goes viral or is it going to be one that dies? What's it going to morph into? What happens when one company buys another social machine? What happens, you know, all those types of things. This is going to take years to do, but this is the sort of thing I've been trying to look at at the Library of Congress by looking, I now want to look back at the, the birth of Twitter and the birth of Wikipedia and the birth of, I can't get to Facebook, but, um, if anyone knows anyone who can get me into the first month of Facebook, the first year, of, that's what I want, to look at the birth of these machines and then look at the tipping points where they went big and apply this type of analysis. I think that's going to be really important for the future of this work. This is theoretical, right? So, this, I'm, now, so I'm going to go back now into the practical. And I'm going to finish. Is that me counting me down? Yeah, I'm okay, All right. I'm going to finish by talking about observatories. Because it, <laughs> looking at that work that the math, our mathematicians have done on Zooniverse, right? to do that on lots of different social machines cannot be done by one group in one university, or even an EPSLC project funded for three years, or even the Web Science Trust Network of Labs. It needs what these guys do. It needs global organization. You cannot do it. Physicists cannot do what they do. They cannot give us the potential answers to life, the universe, and everything without the global effort. You know, over the centuries, they've got very good at asking for money. They build their telescopes, or they buy their telescopes. They, they get the data from the images, and then they, they pull that data. And that was no easy task. But they, they have worked out a way to rub along together. They've, they have thousands of people on their publications. And they've worked out how to actually pull the data and share it to come up. Look at CERN as an example of where they do this work in order to solve the big, but not solve, try and find answers to some of the biggest problems that uh, science considers. And we've heard a lot in this symposium about what the climate scientists do. Forget, I must get this graph, check this PowerPoint change. This is meant to represent how, and uh, ah, you're, you're the lovely photographer, I've forgotten his name. He was <laughs> yeah, talking about you know, f weather forecasting. This is one of my favorite topics at the moment in terms of what we're trying to do with social machine forecasting. 
is um, you know, weather forecasting has now become quite um, a, a, it's an industry. And as um, uh, I'm going to talk a bit later about how it didn't used to be like that, but basically now we've got 200 or more years of data. We've got very powerful computers. We collect data day in, day out from, from weather stations all around the world. We have incredibly powerful machines and algorithms and models so that we can get accurate-ish accurate forecasts for the weather for tomorrow and the next day and ideas of what's going to be, the trends are going to be. This is so important. And then you want to do climate science, you've got to add in all the other disciplines like oceanography and what's happened with the glaciers and everything in order to try and understand that. But the one thing they do have that we don't in our world is this is all about physical things. Right? In our world, we're dealing with people. And people have their own ideas about what they're going to do. So I liken what we do in trying to create observatories and global partnerships for doing subjects like web science. The problem we have is, and I think if you've ever read your Asimov and Foundations and Empire, this is all about what they did, you know, trying to, you can't predict what an individual will do, but you can potentially forecast what people will do en masse. And uh, it's that sort of thing. We did actually want to call web science, um, oh, my mind's gone. What is it? Um, Foundation. No, it, psycho history. Thank you. Sorry, my brain's a bit foggy this week. Uh, it's the jet lag. Uh, psycho history. We want, but we felt people, and Tim wanted to call it philosophical engineering <laughs> as well. But um, uh, we felt people wouldn't understand, so we called it web science. And everyone thought that was all about. Um, very technical thing about the web, just that little system with the HTTP and H, uh, HTML. Anyway, um, yeah, so we have the, the, the problem in our world, in all, all we've been talking, a lot of what we've been talking about today is that we have people. And once you try and observe people, um, they tend to change what they do. So, uh, you have some quantum effects. So, it, you know, I'm not pretending it's easy, but we can't begin to do it unless we share our data. What I would like is that data that Hugh Glaser had on the work we'd done for the EPSRC and the data Bill had on the work he did in 2004 to be available to me. So I could go and look at it, see what they did, compare it, contrast it, so I could get ideas about how to repeat those experiments today with better tools, more data, and so on. I can read the papers, but I can't get the data. We so need, as a community, to work out a way of globally sharing our data. Doesn't mean you have to give you all my data about confidential stuff, there's all the issues of privacy to worry about, but we can share derived data and for sure we can tell each other we've got it. All right? How do I know where the data is on Ebola, on uh, the uh, uh, Nepal earthquake? You know, who's got, who's got the data in the social media about that? I have to talk to people who know people who've got it. And uh, so this is what this project's about, to try and get a glo to create a global effort to share, our, to make our, the, the data available, at least the knowledge about where the data is and what I've done with it available. So it's us with our little software telescopes looking at this amazing socio-technical world. And the idea is everyone stores their own data in a data repository of their choice and publishes uh, the metadata as a common standard. And then we can uh, encourage other people to look at the data through the tools that we've developed and have a community of observers uh, working together. We have a, built a, a data set at Southampton, uh, sorry, an observatory at Southampton. If you look at it, if you just go to oh, Southampton Web Observatory, you'll get it in Google. Um, and you'll see the data sets we've collected and we have access control. So if it's a tick, that means you can, if you know how to do it, um, you, I, I'm not, you know, this, this is a point where we, we have to find ways to enable the non-techies to look at this data. So we need the visualization tools, the, the, the tools that the HCI community are developing and others. But we, um, we, at least I can tell people it's there and the techies can, can get to it. Um, this is why you need the interdisciplinary. If it's a cross, that means you need to talk to the person who's got the data set, see if you could maybe share it under terms and conditions, or maybe look at some derived data. I want to get people to publish their derived data more, make it available, because that's easy, easier. 
And then you can, we, we print, publish the visualizations as well. I won't waste time now and go into the, the um, observatory. I'll show you the examples. I hope you've got the idea. Uh, and then we link them all up. We have a few established, and I just want observatories all over the world. Basically, I just want everyone sitting in this room to say, hi, I'm observatory. I've got this data. How do we know you've got the data? Well, this Web Science Trust that we set up, we've, we, we, will, we are collecting, we are harvesting the metadata. So if you, um, if you have um, data in a repository, uh, tell us you've got it. Put it into, we're using schema.org, that may change. It's a very simple metadata schema. Just says, this is the project, this is the who produced it, this is the type of data, uh, can you or can you not access it? And we want to make that much more sophisticated so we can build search engines to tell, help people know where, what type of, where the different uh, types of, where the different data sets are, like, like who's got Ebola data sets. And we're trying, and building a crawler so that once you've told us you're an observatory, we crawl it every day and, um, and, and keep it up to date. I don't want to be doing this forever. All right, I've spent for 15 years trying to keep an open access uh, ePrints repository going. Uh, open source stuff is very difficult to keep going. I'd love someone else to run it, but for the moment, uh, we're doing it. And um, please, I want you to join in. We have a simple ambition to map the digital universe. And this is what Katya and I were talking about when I was in Indiana earlier this year. This idea of, it suddenly came to me, I've got this big bang theory for social machines also, we need to do some storm chasing. Now, this really links back to the, uh, the, the, the previous talk, where, because back 200 years ago, nobody knew how the, and it was all, as you said, it was all uh, very, weather was wrapped up with uh, what God did, whoever your God was. And, and the idea of tracking a storm was considered to be either totally irreverent, so against God, or just impossible because weather was not forecastable. That's what they said. And if you read this book, this has inspired me hugely, The Weather Experiment, The Pioneers Who Sought to See the Future, by Peter Moore, he goes through this whole history of how uh, Loomis um, got, I think it was six people who were tracking data from storms. And of course, in the 19th century, they were doing it all on paper, and they were exchanging information by letters. Um, but basically, he got six people to be tracking storms around New York. And they did one storm as an experiment, I think in 1842, uh, 1841. And then they were all set waiting for the next big storm. And there were two storms, one after the other, in 18, February 1842. And these six or seven scientists tracked that data. And then Loomis pulled all that data together and published his paper on two storms which were experienced throughout the United States in the month of February 1842. Interesting to me that it's a single author paper, right? Because actually there's a lot of people contributed to this, but in those days that was obviously perfectly acceptable, or maybe not, I don't know, maybe they all fell out afterwards. But uh, the interesting thing was that he pulled all that data together. Now, so I'm just about finished. So we go from that to I can now get StormTrack 7 weather app on my mobile phone. I downloaded it this morning, right? And look what's happened in the last, what, it's less than, less than 200 years, but actually, that's amazing what we've done in that time. Are we gonna take 200 years to do social machines? I don't know, but this is what I want to leave you with. I'd like you to join me in the web storm chasing project. Can, can we try this approach for something like web science or other data-rich sciences? And we're really talking about many possible examples where people use the internet and social media to collectively make decisions, such as natural disasters, earthquakes, and pandemics. We had a talk yesterday about how they dealt with the Ebola crisis at NIH. Um, and then there are the social storms, such as, to name just one thing, the US election, which the whole world is watching in some trepidation. This is about understanding, not prediction. It's about forecasting. It's about scenario generation to support policymakers and to provide business and organization intelligence. And it follows the patterns of the new ABCs of research, Ben. It's all about collecting the data and then working out the theory. So if you're interested, I think we can do it. It's really complicated. There are organizations like the RDA, the Research Data Alliance, 
um, other organizations that are pulling data sets together, making them available at least for research. Because I mean, what is an absolute, I find that you put huge amounts of effort, sometimes millions of pounds into collecting data sets and they just decay on a PhD student server and disappear. And that experiment is not repeatable, reusable, reproducible, all the things that good science should be. We have to learn as a community to pull together. Now, there'll be lots of people, of course, lots of very important political pundits talking about how they predicted the result of the US election. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is after the election, sharing, uh, joining a working, creating a working group somehow, <laughs> we, and then, after the election, actually analyzing the data we have collectively collected in order to help us build models for analyzing the next election and the next election. And if you're interested, email me or give me your business card after the session. And I'm actually hosting an event at the um, uh, Library of Congress on the 16th of June called Saving the Web the ethics and challenges of preserving what's on the internet. It's all about the same thing, because libraries have this problem in space. What do they store? How do they store it? And how do they make it accessible to researchers in hundreds of years' time, not just next year? Yeah, so that's here for the people who live in DC. It's the 16th of June. It's an open event uh, organized by the Kluge Research Center. The speakers include Vint Cerf, Bob Kahn, and somebody called Katia Borna. Thank you.
<laughs> I think their knowledge in today's time and age is power. And so many, many commercial and also academic and um, also sometimes government institutions, they are trying to get more and more of the world's knowledge. And they are trying to also use Watson and other technology to get more knowledge out of that knowledge. And I think Mandy is also strongly arguing for keeping some of that knowledge open, not private. And I think we all would benefit from, from um, having more of that knowledge available to many more people. I think it would solve a lot of other issues because uh, ultimately access to knowledge also means access to education means access to uh, better jobs, access to better health. I think this entire inequality uh, discussion which we have right now is very much based on who has access to knowledge and education. And so I would love to see some of the storm chasing going on. And, and if you can connect, Wendy, to forces here in the US or worldwide, please do so. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about what you're saying. I, I remember a play, I, I, I think I'm too old, other people, it was called The Last Sweet Days of Isaac. Does anyone know this play? It was, not, you're probably, your parents weren't born yet. But um, it, the idea was it was, a, it was just when video cameras were coming out, and there was a play about a young man who recorded himself all the time. Um, and then towards the end of the play, he recognizes it's gonna take his whole lifetime to watch the film. And so it was that self-referential thing. And so I'm wondering about, as, I, as I'm listening to you, I, and, and I'm, I'm a, a psychiatrist is my field, it's helpful to know, and I, I'm thinking, you know, we, we, we didn't record or collect or anything for, you know, the last 2,000 years. We, we very selectively collected and captured what our social interactions are and whether or not I went into the, into the bakery and bought, you know, and all of those kinds of things. So, I wondered about that, we didn't do that then, but it does seem to me that what really is happening is that we've moved our entire lives online. And then when you talk about studying the web, you're not talking about studying the web, it's actually anthropology. What you're talking about is capturing and studying human life as it's moving forward. And in some ways it sounds like it's about the web, and even when you modify it with you know, saying social machines, right? really what you're talking about is, is um, a perspective anthropology.
benefit of our activities, as it generally works for us and not against us. But there are major issues about who manages the world, you know, how it's governed, and who looks after the data, and who has what rights to do what with your data. Major, major issues about that. Um, so, would there be any um, ideas about what that would mean, how you would measure whether it's going in the right or the wrong direction? Well, that, uh, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> uh, all I do at the moment, that's what I, I sort of, the project I talked about at the Library of Congress is Internet Histories and Futures, because to me, in order to understand that, I need to look back at what happened over the last only 20 odd years. Uh, so, we haven't got much history, just look back and then you can look forward. So, I think the history of this is really important. That's why I want to go back to the early days of the social machines as they evolved. Rather than trying to think about the future, you don't have So, there are ways to do something just simply over 25 years to do other kinds of things outside of the web change, like that. Good, yes. Yeah. I wonder why we want to stick to the notion of the metaphor of machine here. Because if you look at the history of design, the machine metaphor was broken during the Bauhaus time in order to precisely to change the notion of the ethics of design. And the same issues arise here. So I was just curious. Well, you have to suspend what, uh, your definition of a machine, right? We, we, use, we use the term. Uh, uh, again, it's a meme because um, it, it's the term typical in this book, so we, we call that our project social machines. It's not just because of us, there are other people talking about social machines because of Tim using the word in the book. But don't overlay it with any great thoughts about because it, it was the, I don't know, how he how we, how we decided to use that term. Um, it's hard to put it back on the box now. Uh, that I understand, but it does raise certain issues with respect to the metaphor itself. Yes. And, but, and as if we are moving towards uh, socializing the machine itself as a social no, I, metaphor. No, I, I, I don't think of it like that. Right? So that's what I say. Suspend the definition of a machine. Think of a social machine as one word, a new word. Do a Ted Nelson and think of it as a new word. Not, don't, don't hang the old machine analogy onto it. What I'm saying. We should spell it to one word and then it would be so difficult. Well, in fact, that's what we did with the associate project, of course, associate. But there are now um, papers being written about social machines, so it's hard to put, put it back in the box. People are tired of the break, it's hot. Yeah. Go on, last question then. Okay, can you reflect on how it would help with governance to have the kind of insight about How would it help with internet governance or governance on the part of? Well, I just think uh, my what I say to um, the PhD students who come in the web science um, is that they will be the, they will be a, the political advisors of the future. They'll go out and work in companies and will have this interdisciplinary idea of, of how these systems are built and how they what uh, the um, influences on them, what effect they have influences on them. How and thinking of it from a ecosystem point of view rather than technical or conceptual. So our students, I don't know, there are lots of web science students as allied allies all around the world, and they're getting amazing jobs in that, in that sort of world. So I just think it, over time it will, it will help to influence our policy makers and the companies and so forth. We should break up. Everyone looks like they have a rest. Right. Now we've got